Good evening and welcome to our first October council meeting, city council meeting. Would you please join us in pledging allegiance to our country? Ready to begin? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Roll call, please. Councilmember Adam? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Councilmember McNamee? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Here. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Present. We're all present, and we will now go to special presentations. We only have one special presentation tonight, but it's a great one. I'd like to introduce Donald Covarrubias, and I'm not quite sure if I can see him on the screen. He's our fleet services supervisor, and he is going to tell us about a recent wonderful recognition awarded to the City of Thousand Oaks Fleet Services. So, Mr. Covarrubias, good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council Member. Please excuse me while I share my screen. I'm here this evening to present an award from the National Association of Fleet Administrators for ranking 42nd place in the top 100 green fleets in U.S. and Canada. This consists of federal and state and local fleet governments, including fleet operations from local government, personnel, contractors, and services. To put in perspective, there are over 38,000 public fleets in North America alone. Judging criteria included alternative fuel, hybrid vehicles, fuel usage, fuel savings, purchasing policies, and long-range planning. I thank you for your time and your support. Well, that was a brief presentation, but it was a very special one. I want to thank you on behalf of the City Council not only you, but also, of course, all of your colleagues and the department in general for accomplishing something that is really something to be proud of, to be considered number 42 in more than 100 across the country as well as Canada. That is absolutely amazing and speaks to the hard work and professionalism of our department, uh, public works, and of course, also sustainability. Really appreciate that and congratulations. Thank that, you. That is the... Uh, end of our special presentation, and we will now go to our public comments. Madam Clerk. This is in time and place for public comments for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the Council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the council unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the city manager for administrative follow-up. Eight individuals have requested to speak, and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is Samantha Galici Galisano or Galiciano. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor Bill De La Pena. Mayor Pro Tem Engler and council members. My name is Samantha Galici now, and I'm a resident of Woodland Hills, California. I recently joined the Friends of the Thousand Oaks Library and currently manage our Facebook and Instagram pages. My purpose here today is to let you know that during the week of October 17th through the 23rd, the Friends of the Thousand Oaks Library will be celebrating the National Friends of Libraries Week. We invite you to celebrate with us. The Friends of the Thousand Oaks Library is the booster club for the libraries in our city. Our purpose is to raise funds to support and assist the library in its work. We help the library promote learning, literacy, and cultural knowledge. We are an all-volunteer, energetic, and focused organization. We showcase gently used books for sale in bookshops in both the Grant R. Brimhall and Newberry Park libraries. Sales from used books donated to us by members of the community generate thousands of dollars for an enhanced library services. And it doesn't stop there. Our many friends volunteers sell books on Amazon and eBay, as well as hold community book sales. 
Our next sale is in early December, just in time for your holiday shopping. We also write grants. This past year, we received $21,000 in grant funding to enable outreach programs and provide support to our libraries. We recruit volunteers of all ages to work with us to support the libraries, issue a newsletter, and maintain an active website and social media presence. We conduct fundraising campaigns, most recently receiving generous donations to support maintenance of the library saltwater, saltwater aquarium and the purchase of books for the Friendly Book Discussion Group, the History Book Discussion Group, and the Book Club in a Box program. We also participate in community activities like the upcoming CRPD Trunk or Treat Halloween event and the Rotary Thousand Oaks Street Fair. Friends of the Thousand Oaks Library invite you to become members and hope you will celebrate with us the National Friends of Libraries Week. Lastly, please check out our website, www.ftol.org, for how to become a member and information on our other services. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's exciting news and a wonderful update. Thank you. Next speaker is Roseanne Witt and then Kat Selm. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Roseanne Witt. I moved to Thousand Oaks 27 years ago and raised my family here. September was National Suicide Prevention Month. The global health community's healthy climate prescription addressed to nations ahead of next month's climate negotiations stated, climate change impacts, drought, heat, wildfire, storms, flooding, are taking a serious toll on people's mental health, causing post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety and worsening existing conditions. A study of 10,000 teens and young people in 10 countries links climate change and government inaction to extreme psychological distress. Two thirds of youth surveyed feel sad and anxious. Over half feel angry and powerless. Eight in 10 expect a frightening future. 40% hesitate to have children. 56% fear humanity is doomed. Climate worries disrupt their ability to eat, sleep, study, work, and enjoy life. Two thirds think officials lie about the effectiveness of proposed actions, leaving youth feeling betrayed and distrustful of adults. As the mother of two young adults who have expressed similar sentiments, I find these statistics extremely alarming, as I think anyone with young people in their lives would. As parents, teachers, leaders, and role models, adults must take responsibility for the future we've created. To counter their despair, our kids need to see policymakers acting with urgency. More can and must be done now. With every vote you take, I urge you to consider how you can use it to ensure cleaner air and water, more resilient communities for both people and nature, a safer, more stable climate, and a just, equitable future all of us can look forward to. So our children and grandchildren don't have to feel like they're standing all alone at the edge of an abyss. Because as one teen respondent stated, I don't want to die, but I don't want to live in a world that doesn't care for children and animals. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kat Selm is next, followed by Brad Poteet. Hi, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Kat and I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks and I'm a conservation and open space professional. I wanna share with you some thoughts I have about the Huntington Beach oil spill. I've never understood the personal impacts of an offshore oil spill because I didn't grow up by the beach and I didn't grow up in oil country. So my foray into environmental disasters was more like coal ash pond spills or PFAS and Teflon byproducts being dumped into the beautiful Appalachian streams and rivers I played in as a youth. So while those incidents were personally devastating as a nature lover, they were more silent killers with these contaminants settling into deep sediments to be trapped for generations. But the evidence of an oil spill like the one at Huntington Beach on October 2nd is much more in your face. Dead birds and fish, destruction of sensitive wetland habitat, closed beaches and a depressed tourism economy are just some of the obvious impacts. 
but the psychological impacts are impossible to experience until it's personal. In watching the Huntington Beach disaster play out, I had a very different reaction than I would have any other point in my life. I thought, what if these were my coastal wetlands, the ones that I steward for my job? What if it was my cute little threatened Western snowy plover chicks coated in oil, the same ones that I and hundreds of community members pick up trash for each year in advance of breeding season? What if this was the beach that's been my staycation sanctuary every year or the place with the tide pools where I go to look for snail shells? What if this happened at my favorite swimming spot or a place that I go to surf when I'm feeling brave? What if this happened to me? Well, it very well could. This could be a story about Ventura County and about all of us, as there are still 14 active offshore oil platforms off the coast of Southern California. We all have personal connections to nature, whether you hike, ski, swim, have outdoor picnics and beach days with your family, or you play soccer or softball. We all rely on healthy air and water for our psychological well-being. But the reality is we don't have to rely on these leaky, dangerous, and explosive energy sources anymore. Oil and gas are not getting any cheaper, and that's simply because we've found all the easy stuff. It only gets harder, more dangerous, and expensive to extract oil and gas, whereas clean energy like wind and solar come down in price as we quickly and steadily transition to them. I'd feel a lot less worried for our health and safety, our fisheries and local economy, and the wildlife in our oceans and coastal wetlands if our coastline was dotted with offshore wind platforms instead. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brad Poteet, followed by Dan Scully. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'd like to take this uh, short minute of time to um, uh, come against the uh, Greenhouse Gas Coalition that's asking the City Council Members to allow all new construction and remodels to be only electric. Um, Again, this is Brad Poteet. I reside in the city of Thousand Oaks. I'm a contractor. Um, this all started with a movie, An Inconvenient Truth, that helped Al Gore get his message out. It had a lot of fear mongering, which often people use when their underlying ideas are very questionable. This message, the message that we will all burn up if we do not eliminate carbon dioxide emissions, to be sure, the movie featured scientists and computer modelers who, are, who all sounded very authoritative. But the movie came out in 2006. If it were true, all these bad things would have come to pass some 10 years ago. Well, they didn't. This is because the computer modeling had flaws. If some of the variables in the equations change even slightly, the outcomes that get predicted have a huge range from zero climate change to the prediction that all life ends on Earth. What really made the movie a success was the inaccurate modeling software. It also, it also made Al Gore into a billionaire, but I digress. The Earth goes through healing and cooling cycles, and we're in a heating cycle right now. Our climate is not and has never been st static. Finally, I'd like to remind you that in the 1970s, scientists predicted that we were heading into an ice age. My message to the city council, please do not entertain this. There are far more pressing issues for us at this time. And uh, that's the end of my statements. Thank you. Next up, we have Dan Scully followed by Karen Martin. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to address the uh, concerning um, the proposal made by the Greenhouse Gas Coalition to the City Council requiring all new construction and remodeling to be completely electric. I feel this proposal is extreme and lacks the accurate data and science to support such a measure. Natural gas in Americans' homes produce such little carbon dioxide emissions that it seems so insignificant to bring forward such an extreme proposal. The requirement for new homes to be built with only electric appliances and to ban natural gas hookups in new residential construction will result, result in notably higher utility bills. Why would we eliminate something that's perfectly acceptable alternative that's cheaper, clean, and very efficient? We must implement a balanced approach to California's complex energy needs 
that includes the use of natural gas. So let's, let's dig a little deeper and point out the fact that electric cars are charged using certain fossil fuels such as coal and natural gas. It does not all come from wind or solar panels. Electricity is not as pure as many may want us all think. So I urge the city council to focus on much bigger real problems that our city faces today. And this is not one of them. Thanks a lot for your time. Next, we have Karen Martin and then Richard Winston. Okay, we will go straight to Richard Winston. Good evening. Oh, I hit the wrong button here. You're on. We can hear you. Uh, okay, here we are. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Winston. I'm a resident of Newbury Park. I'm uh, here to speak out against the proposal by the Greenhouse uh, Gas uh, Co the Greenhouse Gas Coalition regarding the requirement that all new uh, and remodeling construction in the city be totally electric. This uh, proposal is this this group uh, claims that if we don't. Uh, Excuse me. By the way, that if we, if we don't uh, do something, that the world is going to overheat and we're all going to die. But that's not. This is not true. I mean, is this is this really a fact? They claim gas-powered homes are the second highest greenhouse gas emitters behind cars, but that's not necessarily so. And our, one of the costs of their proposal. This will drive up the cost of build of a new building greatly when. Current, I mean, current homes are expensive enough that people are leaving the state to find an affordable place to live. I don't think it's a good idea. And uh, this is another example of a political movement that has its own agenda and not an agenda that's in the interest of everyday citizens. The proposal means more government, more regulation, more big brother, less freedom for the citizens of Thousand Oaks. And what's worse, it won't accomplish uh, what, what they claim it will. It's a bad idea, and I don't feel that the city council should waste any more time on it. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Clint Foltz, and that may be our last speaker. Hello, my name is Clint Foltz. I live in Thousand Oaks, and I'm a member of the Conejo Climate Coalition. That's Conejo Climate Coalition. The climate crisis takes many disparate forms and affects many different aspects of our lives. And yet, the primary cause of the climate crisis is our unnecessary dependence on fossil fuels. The oil leak off the coast of Orange County was reported October 1st and confirmed the next morning as crude oil washed onto the sands of Huntington Beach and spread south. The coastline was closed for more than a week, creating economic turmoil for local businesses. An estimated 126,000 gallons had spread into, into an oil slick covering about 13 square miles. Investigators are still searching for which of thousands of ships could have ripped open the pipeline with its anchor. California has suffered 40 significant pipeline incidents a year on average since 1986. Nearly 1,400 oil and gas pipeline leaks, spills, and other incidents have caused at least $1.2 billion, that's billion with a B, in damages, 230 injuries and 53 deaths over the same time. This year is on pace to be one of the most active and costliest years for disasters in the United States. The U.S. disaster costs for the first nine months of 2021 are $104.8 billion, already surpassing the costs for all of 2020. At least 85% of the world's population has been affected by human-induced climate change, a new study shows. Researchers used machine learning to analyze more than 100,000 studies of weather events and found four-fifths of the world's land area has suffered impacts linked to global warming. Let's not forget Ventura County's average temperature has increased 4.7 uh, degrees since 1895, making ours the fastest warming county in the continental United States. The World Health Organization, in a special new report, is calling for governments and policymakers to act with urgency on the climate and health crises. The report describes climate change as the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Meanwhile, 
The world subsidizes fossil fuels to the tune of $11 million a minute. That's the amount of direct and indirect subsidies the International Monetary Fund has calculated that the global fossil fuel industry receives to ensure that cooking the planet remains profitable for them. If you do the math, it comes out to a, around $4.9 trillion a year. We can't afford to continue pouring money into fossil fuels and fossil fuel in infrastructure. It's incredibly dangerous, fiscally irresponsible, and leaves an unnecessary burden to future generations. Let's make every decision with this in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any additional speakers? Madam Mayor, we do not have any additional public comment speakers at this time. And this question gets us in compliance with a new law called AB 361. Thank you. We will now go to our consent calendar. And I'm asking my colleagues if you would like to pull any particular item, and if not, ask King for a motion. Madam Mayor. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about item 7G. Okay, we will pull item 7G. There are 7. no other uh, concerns. I will move the balance of the consent calendar. Excellent. I don't see any other concerns. I will call for a vote. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. And do we have any speakers for this particular item? Madam Mayor, we do not at this time. Okay, thank you. Then we will go to item 7G. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I just like the, I understand the program, I believe. I just like a little more explanation about the uh, origin of the program. And it looks like it, it had to do with uh, state uh, provisions for our COVID situation. And also, am I correct in assuming that the uh, that initial uh, bill passed by the Biden administration, the COVID relief back I guess in January, did that enter into this uh, item G as well? So I can answer that, Mr. Jones. This is Sherry Johnson, Revenue Operations Manager. And as far as the uh, administration efforts go, the state and federal, well, excuse me, the state moratorium, which ceased the ability for the city to or any water purveyor to disconnect water service for an inability to pay happened back in April of 2020. And that was uh, one of Governor Newsom's executive orders. As far as uh, the cessation of late fees as they relate to business licenses uh, and utility billing, that was city council's decision, which occurred uh, right around the same time that COVID Began, and that was to protect the citizens we serve from occurring additional debt during uh, unprecedented times. Mr. Jones, does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, the, do the people that need to, uh, you know, take care of the uh, uh, fees that have accumulated, do they have a certain period of time to do that? Yeah, so if we were to, uh, if this were to be approved, we wouldn't just shut everybody off on January 1st that was unable to pay their bills. Um, thankfully, the city has an excellent notification process. So we would be sending reminder letters. Uh, we would be tagging properties to let them know, uh, offering payment plans uh, to allow the opportunity to not have to pay a balance all at once. Uh, and also staff does uh, perform phone calls for anyone we have a phone number on record to before anyone would ever be shut off for their inability to pay. And I understand there is some state money. Is there available to us for any fees that are un go uncollected? Is, is that right? That's correct. So thankfully the state water board put out an arrearage program that we've already responded uh, to their survey water purveyors can apply for funding for their defined arrearage period. 
We're currently in the application process, but the preliminary survey results and the data we submitted, they responded positively and preliminary suggested that there's plenty of funding to cover all of our arrearages for that defined period. And that payment would be made in Jan no later than January of this coming year. Well, I think it was a wonderful program. And I know people who lost their jobs certainly needed relief, <laughs> they needed help. And I'm glad we weren't, didn't have to turn off their water or well, I don't know how you'd turn off their sewer exactly. <laughs> but I'm glad <clears throat> that we were able to accommodate them. And uh, uh, I was, I'm glad that the state does have a program to reimburse us. If, I see Jamie here, I guess. Are you, are you happy that, that we're going to come out of this uh, breaking even, probably? Or? Yeah, no, and I, I just wanted to clarify. So this was under the Trump administration in December um, of 2020. Trump administration passed a stimulus package back in December. So unfortunately, it's taken 10 months for the state to finally get this funding out to the water agencies across the state in order to, um, you know, pay off the late balances for water customers. I um, wish it would taken, wish it had been quicker to get this relief out to our customers, but glad that it will finally be coming out in the next two months, hopefully, that we'll be able to take care of um, our customers' bills. That well, I thank the Trump able administration. Able to be paid due to COVID. But, uh, but I, uh, as I said, I presume we're coming out pretty close to even on this whole matter, do you think? <clears throat> yeah, as Ms. Johnson shared, um, based on our latest guidance from the state arrearage program, um, we do anticipate all of our balances to be paid. By the state. Good, and I'd like to thank Sherry for a very uh, comprehensive and excellent report on this. Thank you. Council Member Jones, would you like to move approval yes, of item I, 7G? Yes, I will move uh, item 7G. Thank you. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? That's a yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And with that, we go straight to our department reports, item 10A, dealing with our community development department work program. That's a status report and a legislative update presented by our community development director, Mr. Calvin Parker. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Tonight, I'll be discussing the Community Development Department work program, providing a status report and a legislative update. I will be joined in this presentation by Mina Leba, our Legislative Affairs Manager. The city's experienced a new level of investment in recent history, including residential properties, repositioned commercial properties, and the integration of city council priorities. These and other forces are influencing the workload and activities of the community development department and employees. Rapidly evolving legislative landscape at the state level, advanced planning initiatives, including a comprehensive general plan update, high levels of development activity, efforts to promote efficiencies that improve the customer experience, and staffing transitions are all contributing to this challenging time. This brief presentation will provide more details regarding this active and exciting time within the department. Speaking of active and exciting projects, our advanced planning team has embarked upon this comprehensive general plan update I've just mentioned. This is the first comprehensive update in the city's history. As part of that, the nine mandatory elements from the state are being updated as well as optional chapters. The city and the city council reached a major milestone in this project back in May of this year when city council endorsed a comprehensive land use map. This map is being used to feed into the housing element, which is staff's number one priority in terms of processing on the advanced side in order to meet state mandated deadlines. The state is requiring our housing element to be adopted by city council 
by February of 2022. As you may be aware, the Planning Commission conducted a meeting to receive comments on the draft housing element, which was subsequently submitted to the state last week. Final review and revisions of the document will take place between now and December of this year, at which time staff will return to the Planning Commission to make a formal recommendation to City Council in order to take formal action in January of 2022 in order for staff to meet the state mandated deadline. Part of that process and one of the work programs of the housing element is the inclusionary housing ordinance. Staff has prepared a request for qualifications and a request for proposals for the project and anticipate releasing that document in January of 2022. Following review and selection of a consultant, work will proceed and staff will circle back to city council to take formal action on an updated inclusionary housing linkage fee. Moving forward on a faster pace is the objective standards, which is a way to remove all subjective human element from decision-making in the planning process. Staff is currently preparing objective standards that will be presented to planning commission on October 25th will make a recommendation to City Council, and we anticipate this item being back before City Council in November of this year. Lastly, amongst the major initiatives is the Climate Environmental Action Plan. While this project is being prepared by the Public Works Department, it is an integral part to our comprehensive general plan update, and its policies and goals will be implemented throughout that document. Public Works staff intends to return to City Council with an update at the next City Council meeting. The Development Planning Division is experiencing a substantial increase in the number of permit applications over the past four years. The total number of permit applications has increased steadily since 2018, up from a low of 391 to almost 800 permits in 2021. The number of applications has literally doubled in that four year span. Despite this increased volume, the division has been very productive as evidenced by the rise in the number of pre-screen applications heard by city council, which has seen seven already this year. A number of large and challenging projects included in the summary of projects listed above Many of these projects require a measure E unit allocation in a general plan amendment. If these projects requiring these applications are approved to move forward by city council, they are then resubmitted for pre-application and then yet again as a formal entitlement so staff can conduct an environmental review. Cases that require a general plan amendment or any legislative action such as a measure E unit allocation also require development agreement. Generally, these projects are extremely complex, they're time consuming, and they extend over a number of years at times in order to be processed. The building section is experiencing high volume of permit activity spurred by certain segments of permit types. This bar graph depicts a chart where permits issued activity as measured from January to August 31st, because after that, this report was being prepared in the identified years. For calendar year 2021 of that same January to August period has seen an increase in the permits as compared to the previous four years. The recent trends are impacted by a few segments of construction, most prominently new solar installations. Along these lines, other segments of construction, such as accessory dwelling units, commonly referred to as granny flats, single family additions and alterations, and swimming pools have seen moderate to significant increases in permit activity. The code compliance section is currently stable in its operations. Cases have been lower during COVID-19. During the pandemic, Co-compliance staff acted as COVID-19 ambassadors for the purposes of health order enforcement at the county level within city limits. 
COVID-19 related enforcement continues, but to a much lesser extent through this current period of mask mandates. The table on your screen summarizes the number of investigations and case closures for the past four calendar years. Lower case closures in calendar years 2018 and 19 were the result of staff vacancies at that time. Currently, the code compliance section is at full capacity levels and pending cases are steadily declining. Implementation of Tyler Intergov, the land management system and permitting system, which is commonly referred to as LMS, is one of the city council's top priorities for this fiscal year. This initiative is driven by the commitment to the city mission, provide extraordinary service to those we serve. The LMS provides the city with new capabilities and functionalities to carry out this mission effectively and efficiently through expanded online services, streamlined processes, interdepartmental communication, enhanced record keeping, increased reporting capabilities, and deployment of technology platforms that can grow with the city as we move into the future. Staff has worked alongside Park Consulting Group, that's the city's land management system implementation consultant, and the software provider, Tyler Intergov Technologies, to map out the city's current processes and to tailor LMS to meet the needs of staff, as well as to improve the experience for residents, businesses, and constituents moving forward into the future. Staff has been diligently making progress on this project. Staff has standardized several processes, which is commonly in a technical sense referred to as templates. Co-compliance staff completed one template that will facilitate all co-compliance activities. The building division completed five templates including more than 300 application types. These five templates are designed to simplify the permitting process for both contractors and city staff. The planning division completed 39 templates, and that includes more than 100 current application types that have been designed to simplify the permitting process for both the applicant side and city staff. The next phase of the project will be the configuration and build of the Tyler Inlegrov IM LMS production system, which will kick off by the end of this year. A thorough testing and training period will follow to prepare before we go live. Now that the LMS design and specifications are near completion, a configuration and build schedule is being detailed by the project management team. Tyler LMS production go live date will be better defined following the completion of some more of our near term activities. At this juncture, I'll turn the presentation over to Mina Leba to discuss legislation as it relates to the Community Development Department. Good evening, honorable mayor and council members. Tonight, I'm here to share with you a legislative update on bills that were recently signed into law. These bills have a direct impact on the Community Development Department. Historically, local land use planning was left primarily under the purview of local government. The legislative landscape has vastly changed. Now, more than ever, the state is involved in local planning and zoning. The state is mandating development standards seeking production targets and creating onerous penalties, such as fines, disqualification from grants, and even judicial intervention. As part of the first year of the biennium, the state legis legislature introduced approximately 2,700 bills. 244 bills were related to land use and housing. 30 of which were identified by the League of California Cities as having direct impact on local government. This year, bills focused on increasing housing supply by targeting local control, deregulation of land use, and state oversight of local housing development. 
although a large number of bills died in committee. These bills have been regulated, re relegated to two-year bills, which simply mean they'll have the opportunity to be reconsidered again during the 2022 session. Next slide, please. Two big targets of our concern next year are parking and state oversight. The legislature continues to view parking limitations as a deregulatory tool to promote housing development. AB 1401 would prohibit cities from requiring minimum parking standards or enforcing a minimum parking requirement on residential, commercial, or other developments, especially if it's located one half mile walking distance of public transit or located within a low vehicle miles traveled area. Parking requirements are seen by the state as impediments or considered wasted space that could be used for additional units or infill development. State oversight is another growing trend. During the legislative cycle, bills with the intent to monitor and adjudicate local governments in developing housing or achieving RENA numbers were introduced. AB 989 proposes a state-appointed appeals committee for developers to seek adjudication, even of projects that have been lawfully denied by the local jurisdiction. These two bills will be closely monitored and opposed next year. Just two days ago, the legislative year technically concluded with the governor's deadline to sign or veto bills. Five critical bills were signed into law as part of the governor's California comeback plan. The plan claims it will increase state housing by a whopping 8,400 units, excuse me, 84,000 units. These new laws will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. The first is AB 8. This law would extend the sunset date of the Housing Crisis Act, or HCA, from 2025 to 2030. As you recall, the first iteration of this bill was enacted into law just last year in 2020 via SB 330. HCA declared a statewide housing crisis and made numerous changes to the Permit Streamlining Act, the Housing Accountability Act. It froze nearly all development fees related to preliminary applications, including essential project specific fees. SBA, SB 8 extends the sunset date of SB 330 for an additional five years. SB 10 is the next bill. This law is an opt-in measure. It will allow cities to pass an ordinance to zone any parcel for up to 10 units of residential density per parcel. The parcel must be located in a transit-rich area, a job-rich area, or an urban infill site. Open space, park sites, or very high wildfire severity areas are disqualified. SB 10 exempts CEQA compliance and removes public input and engagement. SB 10 does not condition for more affordable housing. SB 9 is known as the duplex bill. This law requires cities to ministerially approve without condition, discretion, or public input a housing development containing two residential units on an individual parcel in a single family neighborhood. Additionally, this measure would require ministerial approval on an urban lot split. The resulting housing development may contain up to four units on a parcel designated for one single family home. The city, however, will have the ability to deny a project, number one, based on location, such as a flood and coastal zone, very high wildfire severity zones, 
conservation areas or historic sites. Number two, if the project requires the demolition of existing affordable units or rent controlled units. Number three, if the city determines that a development would have a specific adverse impact on public health, safety, or, or a physical environment that cannot be mitigated. The city also requires certain provisions City can require local objective zoning, subdivision and design standards, four feet setback on rear and side, rental terms for more than 30 days, in other words, no short-term rentals, public utility easement and street access, and one off-street parking space if property is not located within one half mile of a high quality transit corridor or major transit stop. The next bill I wanted to share with you is AB 215. This law would require cities to have a mid-cycle housing element consultation with the California Department of Housing and Community Development or HCD. If housing production is below a regional average, cities would be subject to one, the implementation of pro-housing actions as developed by HCD, two, penalties of $100,000 per month for failure to achieve a regional average, and three, involvement by the state attorney general. And finally, AB 1398. As you recall, the city is part of a larger metropolitan area known as the Southern California Association of Governments or SCAG. The six cycle housing element within SCAG region is due to HCD by October 15th. Prior to AB 1398, jurisdictions that did not adopt a housing element within 120 days of this date were required to develop a housing element every four years instead of eight. AB 1398 has removed the requirement for a four-year housing element regardless of when a juris housing jurisdiction, excuse me, a housing element is adopted by a jurisdiction. With the enactment of AB 1398, jurisdictions that adopt a compliant housing element by February 11, 2022 will still have three years after adoption to complete necessary rezoning. However, jurisdictions that do not have an ado adopted housing element found to be in substantial compliance by HCD by February 11, 2022, must complete all necessary rezoning one year of the housing element due date. Council members, the growing state intervention in local land use and the complexities of new laws, impending two-year bills, and anticipated bills in the near future will certainly have big impacts on the policies, procedures, and workload of the Community Development Department. That concludes my report, and I will turn the presentation over to Director Kelvin Parker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mina. After a sustained period without change in the planning division, the Community Development Department has experienced natural attrition of staff due to retirements and other factors. The city is viewed as an employer of choice, though there, there are fewer highly qualified candidates available than in years past. It is increasingly difficult for the city to, excuse me, to secure highly qualified candidates at an appropriate level of management and technical experience to fill the deputy director level positions. These are critical positions to achieving city goals and selecting candidates that fit the organizational culture is of paramount importance. The Human Resources Department is working with community development to fill the two deputy director positions, one focused on development and the building functions and the other on department operations and advanced planning. With the ongoing vacancy of the city's building official position, 
due to existing difficulties in recruiting highly qualified applicants with substantial experience and certifications. And this is a statewide issue, particularly for technical positions. The city is temporarily relying on support from outside technical consultants. Currently, CSG is providing both building official support as well as plan check services. This combination of services has proven to be effective in meeting the needs of the community. A recruitment for this position is currently being prepared by our human resources department. The community development department is relying on multiple industry specific consultants to supply additional planning resources in order to meet the immediate demand of high level planning project support. Two firms, CSG, which is also providing building support, and a local planning firm, Elevated Entitlements, are under contract to assist us with planning services. Additional funds are being requested to increase the not to exceed amount for these contracts. Depending on the consultants and the projects they're supporting, these fees will be recoverable through project applicant paid fees. In conclusion, it is a very eventful and extremely exciting time to be working in the community development department. The volume of development activity, new legislation, the general plan update, major pre-screens, efficiency improvements, position vacancies, and other major initiatives do not come without some challenges. The department is continuously positioning to meet the demands, improve operations, and to prepare the city for a successful future. With the volume of work being processed by the department, we are proposing a multi-pronged approach that is funding-based and solution-oriented. With that said, staff recommends that city council receive this update on the many factors influencing operations and approve the various financial considerations associated with this item in support of the department's efforts. This concludes staff's presentation. In addition to myself, we have a bevy of staff available to answer questions if there are any. Among those available include Kari Finley, our advanced planning division manager, Jeff Ware, our building services manager, Steve Kearns, the development planning manager, Hader Alawami, our economic development manager, and of course, Mina Leba, our legislative affairs manager. We're all here to answer any question council may have at this time. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank you so very much for a report that is actually very significant. And I'm not sure how many residents are watching tonight, but this was an all encompassing report on the state of development in the city of Thousand Oaks. And it is too bad that our local press is not even reporting or watching. I hope that they are, but they said they weren't tweeting. Um, I want to go to city manager Andrew Powers first before we go to our first council question by council member McNamee. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Abdel Pena. Um, I just wanted to put a final point on it. Uh, um, so a lot of material was covered in there. And as uh, we were preparing for this evening's presentation, we felt it was important to touch on a whole range of topics, uh, you know, based on various questions and, and uh, things that have been raised by all five of you over the course of the last um, uh, six months or so with the landscape uh, consistently changing. Uh, giving you an understanding of, of kind of where we are and uh, and what actions we're taking, um, and we're having daily conversations about uh, how to continue to process through this uh, real um, uh, extreme push right now with uh, all the investments that are happening. And I want to stress to the to the council and to the community: these are all good things. These are good problems to have to have a to have this level of interest and investment from people putting solar panels on their homes to um, building ADUs to support uh, perhaps um, aging parents that they want to put uh, um, 
put on property with them to um, uh, looking to do uh, pools in their yard and investing in their properties with remodels. Two major commercial transformations that are happening out in Rancho Conejo in our biotech sector. All of these things uh, have uh, processing that occurs at a community development. And, on top of that all, the team has been uh, pushing headlong through our general plan update, and I, I really want to make sure the council understands the significance of the work you put in earlier this year to position us. Uh, we are well poised and well positioned to uh, weather through the challenges we're seeing from the state and focus on controlling our local planning. And that has been our commitment to you throughout the year. We've really committed to bring these pre-screens through and continuing to process those and work with those private sector investments so that we can stay in the driver's seat and work collaboratively uh, to uh, advance those investments in our community. So uh, my hat's off to Kelvin and his team. Uh, as he mentioned, it's, it's certainly a tough hiring environment. It's uh, you know, hit and miss. It's that way across our organization. And uh, we, uh, I'm confident that we're going to uh, push through. We're already, we had a new planner join our team uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact. So uh, really um, uh, appreciate Kelvin's leadership through a very challenging uh, period and uh, happy to answer. Uh, we'll be happy to answer. Obviously here, there's a lot of folks here that touch a range of dis dis different disciplines. So happy to answer any questions that the council has. Um, and uh, thanks for indulging us with a wide ranging presentation. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Really appreciate it. This was an extremely thorough report, and I stand corrected that, yes, people are watching tonight, and we'll be reporting on it as well. So um, I'm really glad that uh, people are paying attention, our residents, um, as well as our um, local press. And with that, I would like to, of course, thank uh, Mr. Parker and his team, and of course, our wonderful Legislative Affairs Manager, Mina Leba, and we'll take a question from Council Member Kevin McNamee. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have uh, two concepts to uh, ask. Uh, one is, again, thank you for Mr. Parker and his team and uh, Ms. Leba for doing such a wonderful job with the uh, presentation. Here's my uh, question for you, uh, is that we spoke of AB 1401 and that the parking control by local uh, jurisdictions may be disappearing if that prevails and has an impact on us. Uh, when I spoke with my planning commissioner, Justin Link, about this particular bill, uh, he has a background, as you know, in uh, traffic uh, degrees mm -hmm. in it and also works at Simi Valley in traffic. Very knowledgeable man about these uh, issues regarding parking and so forth. And then I also talked to my traffic commissioner, Victor Hayek, about this very issue as well. And the question I posed to them do we have any studies in the city of Thousand Oaks that looks at how many parking spaces are needed for a studio, a one bedroom, a two bedroom, apartment, condo, townhome? And they said, no, there isn't any study that's done here in Thousand Oaks. In fact, uh, Mr. Link said, there's no study here regionally. And I said, where are the numbers coming from as far as predicting how many parking spaces for a new construction or remodel? He says, we all look at each other and we take a guess at it. And that's what we've been doing. And it's just basically, that's historically what we've always done. My challenge is, is that you're looking at coming down with a number, let's say a one bedroom, having two cars needed, two parking spaces for it. And you can have three possibilities. You're either too high in parking, too low in parking, and one you're spot on. And two of the three are not good for intelligent planning in our development uh, for Thousand Oaks. So I'd like for my council members to think about funding a study to do a randomized look at uh, how much parking is needed for various areas of our city. So when parking comes forth and building development uh, occurs, we can have a little more informed decision about a one bedroom, two bedroom studio, how many parking spaces are really needed so that way we're fair to the developer, the community, and all the other people that are involved with that, that decision process. Uh, again, if uh, Mr. Powers wish, wishes to weigh in on this as well, uh, perhaps it'll give us a little more local control with these um, uh, requests from and demands from Sacramento. 
Sure. So I'm going to let a couple folks tee up on that, uh, um, Councilmember McNamee, to because it's a wide ranging topic. Obviously, um, the uh, you know there are uh, several components here that are important. The first is you know we're going through our housing element uh, uh, process right now, and, and uh, perhaps Tracy or Kelvin can weigh in on that. And and secondarily, to talk a bit about what we have uh, today in terms of of, uh, of parking standards that have been adopted by the council and how they're applied. So. Tracy, Kelvin, others, I'll let you guys just jump in accordingly. Uh, I'll, I'll start if you don't mind, Drew. So uh, thank you for the question. Typically, the way parking works as it relates to housing, if there's an affordable housing piece, the projects are eligible to use the state requirements for parking. In those instances, the state requirements, if they are less restrictive than the city requirements, would supersede what we would require for the project. That's something that the developers are well aware of, and they often remind staff of that as they submit their applications. What we've been tremendously successful in doing is working with the applicants and partnering with the developers to extract more parking in order to meet a community desire to have that within their projects. We've been extremely fortunate in the sense that we've had many projects, seven have gone to council within the last year that require development agreements, which gives us broader flexibility and requiring additional parking above and beyond what is required. In instances where there's not an affordable component, the city parking standards as set by city council and the municipal code absolutely apply. And staff is diligent in applying those standards and we find that for the most part, they work. There are instances and in other factors beyond site-specific conditions that often contribute to that. And those are things that we take into consideration as we move forward with the parking study. The last point I wanna to touch on in regards to parking is that the applicants conduct their own studies and it's based on the private sector desire and need, and they have a full understanding of what it takes to lease their products as they're being built. The last thing that they wanna do as they communicate it to staff is build a project with inadequate parking that'll impact their ability to rent those. So depending on the circumstances, a confluence of those issues would apply to any project invariably. And we try to take those factors into consideration when we make a recommendation on a land use project. So question for you, Mr. Parker, do we have any study that actually has been done formally and not based on tradition and this is the way we've always done it uh, kind of uh, perspective? But no, typically parking is a function of standardized manuals that's produced by the industry that's widely accepted and used. There's two versions of that and it's part of what we rely on in the parking study that's submitted by the applicant and peer reviewed by our staff and determining if a parking scenario is correct for a project. It's a base level that we use, and then we augment it from there based on the unit mix and amenities provided in the project. So we're moving more towards, again, tradition and looking at uh, an outside standard that may or may not be applicable. What I'm looking at as I know the city well is that if I look at the parking requirement at Cal Lutheran with the students, uh, seeing a higher parking demand, some of the apartments that I find on Hillcrest and other areas around there, uh, there's a lot of street parking as compared to on-site parking. And then other areas of the city, there's adequate parking where the people are actually able to park on site and not be uh, forced onto the street to have to walk in late at night, subjected to public safety issues, as well as the inconvenience and inclement weather and uh, uh, other issues that uh, uh, result from that. So uh, like I say, I, I'm not comfortable that we don't have an actual study to look at different areas of the city. And it's something that I think we should do to give you, Mr. Parker, better tools when developers come in saying, well, we've got AB uh, 1401 that says this, but we can negotiate and say, we have studies that show we need this type of parking demand in the area because I'm not comfortable with developers establishing what their parking requirements are because they would reduce the amount of parking because that uh, reduces their profit margin, but force the uh, tenant out on the street to walk in, uh, increasing more congestion on our streets. 
Uh, that's that's my concern there, and I don't think it's uh, out of the realm of doing a reasonable randomized study uh, to figure out what our parking demands are and help uh, our legislative uh, approach to this that we know what our demands are. Builder, developer, this is what we want. And uh, it gives us some backup to say, it's just not tradition. We have a study to support it. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, Bob Engler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, let me take, oh, sorry, took my hand down already. Thank you. Um, just, um, I, I noticed that you, you mentioned, uh, and I, I think I agree with our, our city manager powers that the um, problems that um, were indicated in this report are good problems to have. In other words, there's people coming in um, and investing in our town. Um, I think of the uh, biotech sector out in uh, the Rancho Conejo area where we have people coming in with hundreds of millions of dollars to redevelop some of our industrial areas out there. And that's a good problem to have. And I'm glad that they are doing it. Um, in terms of in terms of your approach, you mentioned that there was uh, four problems. If I there's uh, uh, let's see four issues that you're trying to uh, work with, and that is um, you know the general plan update. Um, there's been a large increase in uh, development activity. Um, you've also are working on the, the new project for the land management system that hopefully will help us in in the future with all our our issues, and then staffing. Uh, we've, we've had some staffing challenges, especially in the deputy director uh, range of, of uh, employees. Um, can you go over a little bit more as exactly how you're approaching the, the um, solutions to those four issues? Uh, and I appreciate uh, if you can give any timelines that we might be able to anticipate. Uh, yes, so we're moving swiftly and with purpose in terms of addressing our staffing issues are working with our human resources department. We currently are in the process of gaining a specified consultant on board to help us with the recruitment of the deputy director positions. And that's more of a targeted recruitment. We searched in house for almost the past year trying to find the appropriate fit for the organization. And we were unsuccessful in that, which is why we're soliciting professional help in that particular area. Additionally, we've brought on additionally hourly worker support to support the department in various areas. One would be in the building services, which is would help with our development activity. Uh, the other would be with our administrative staff, which helps set the organization up and move us through the various processes, which touches all aspects of the department. Additionally, we're in the process of preparing a flyer to recruit for our building official position. And we anticipate that being able to go live, hopefully within the next week or so. And we're, we're expecting that we'll be competitive in the marketplace and finding the right person for us there. In terms of the general plan aspect of it, we're looking to receive council support to bring on additional contract services to provide targeted very specific professional planning help to match up with our specific project needs in order to move our planning projects forward. That would free up staff to work on our general plan with the public, as well as allow us capacity to process our planning development applications faster. As part of that contract help, we're looking to use CSG also with our buildings side of the department to process plan checks, which we're receiving many more of, as I mentioned, in terms of the solar realm, with the granny flats, um, also with various household projects from people around town as they reinvest in their properties. With the land management system, we've brought on park and consultants to help us move that project along in a timely fashion. We've been very happy with the work that they provided through the city. And they've been tremendously successful in moving us forward towards implementation of Tyler InterDev. Thank you. And, and um, you mentioned that you, your code enforcement officers, you have a, um, you're up to up to full strength on that. Is that going to help us erode away any of our backlog of in, in inspections and enforcement? 
Absolutely. We did experience a period of short staffing roughly two years ago, but within the last year and a half, we've been staffed up. And when we have not been supporting the county locally here in our jurisdiction with COVID support, they've been diligently attacking our code enforcement cases and moving them forward to, to compliance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that Council Member McNamee's hand is up again. I'm going to ask a question um, real quick. The regarding our general plan and staffing, with all of these changes in land use law for or for Thousand Oaks and other cities from Sacramento, how are they impacting our general plan process? And that question would be from Mr. Parker. And, and that's great. You know, excellent question. What we're doing with our general plan process is we're moving forward on the course that we set out. The best thing that we can do to maintain the most local control as the legislative landscape changes is to complete the processes that we're currently in right now. Most importantly of that is our housing element. We are in control of where that goes right now. And that's our number one priority from a general plan team perspective. And we're looking to have that completed by January of 2022. What that'll do is give us a working framework and document in place as we see how the new legislation comes from the state and begins to unfold. And then we can adjust from there accordingly. Right now, new legislation is being passed, but we don't know exactly how that's going to be implemented. And quite realistically, it may be followed by trailer bills to provide additional clarity. So the best thing that we can do right now to protect our local controls is to stay the course and move forward on the path we're on. Okay. And Mayor Bill de la Pena, if I could just add a little bit to that. Um, when Mr. Parker refers to the housing element, again, the new legislation that was passed, um, AB 1398, that's a really critical piece of legislation because um, you know, currently, if a city does not have a compliant, you know, uh, does not have a, a certified housing element within the cycle, um, you know, we, typically, if we have it actually certified within the cycle, you have three years to do all of the zoning. In other words, change all of the the, um, the zoning map to uh, to reflect any types of changes to land uses that you need um, in order to have your, you know, that's consistent with your housing element. What this legislation does is it reduces it to a year, but it's not a year from the date that your housing element is certified. It's a year from the date that the housing element is due, which is actually October 2021. So if we do not have a certified housing element by February 2022, we would have to do all of our rezoning by um October 15th, 2022. So we would have very little time to do that. In fact, I would say it would be virtually impossible given CEQA mandates to do that. I, I think it's just impossible to do so. The other thing that legislation did was it it changed the definition of, of when you have a, when those um, penalties kick in. It used to be that you have to have at least submitted the housing element. Now it actually has to be substantially compliant with housing element law. Um, it's not uncommon for cities to go back and forth with HCD over certain terms and conditions in the housing element. This eliminates a lot of that ability to do so because we have a hard deadline um, of February 2022. So from, from our standpoint, the most critical thing that staff needs to prioritize its efforts on is on our housing element. Everything will fall from that. Our general plan, our, um, our climate action plan, everything will fall from that housing element. That is the most important document that the staff, that staff needs to concentrate their efforts on. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, we do have two more hands up. We do have five recommendations before us. Mr. McNamee, well, actually, let me go to Mr. Jones because he has not had a chance to say anything. Uh, Mr. Jones and then Mr. McNamee. Yeah, I, I'd like to ask Tracy or uh, Mina or someone exactly what they believe is going on in Sacramento. I mean, all this concern with you know, making housing more dense and relaxing standards and, and so forth. All looks to me like they're trying to undo a lot of the things that we've done to make this a lovely community. I, 
you know, the next thing we'll know, they're going to have a statewide planning department that just is going <laughs> to this is going to go over. Yeah. You know, and, and we won't have city planning anymore. I, I exactly. what is this? Yeah. Tremendous there, there's concern been on high de density housing and doing away with set four foot setback. I mean, that's nothing. I. I don't get it. I mean, we've labored, and maybe cities have labored to have a lovely, attractive community with all the, these amenities, so people would love to live here. Yeah, and and they're just go, going to what, run roughshod over that. I don't. I, well, what is inspiring this? Do, do you so, know? So, Councilmember Jones, there has been this trend for several years now from state legislature to um, to basically um, uh, encourage, and I'm using the word encourage in a very broad manner, to encourage the construction of housing. Um, you, mean, you mean require rather than encourage. Exactly, exactly, require the construction of housing. Um, you know, there, you know, I think that from our standpoint, at least from my perspective, I think one of the, the you know, not one of, but one of the great things that our city is doing is again, the comprehensive general plan update. You know, what we're doing with that general plan update and what you all did in May uh, with the endorsed land use map is you basically are, are showing to the state and you're and you're showing to the community that there is room for more housing in the community and that that housing can be uh, constructed in a way that meets our standards and meets our, our design standards and our local preferences. And I think that that's probably one of the best things that we can do. We aren't adopting a general plan that is going to, um, you know, you know, uh, prohibit any type of, of development in the future. We're actually adopting a general plan that's going to allow some housing in certain areas throughout the city and in such a manner that will, that will again, comply with what we deem to be quality of life issues, such as design and traffic patterns, et cetera. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that, you know, that, that that's, you know, that's going to send a good message. You know, there are a lot of cities, though, that do have a reputation for not allowing housing over the years. Um, I also think that with the, um, you know, when RDA was abolished, you know, there, we had a, a financial stream um, for, uh, for partnering with affordable housing providers to provide affordable housing once RDA was dissolved those revenues, you know, went away. And so you're seeing a, a much more significant housing crisis than we did when we did have redevelopment in the state. Um, so I think it's just a, a combination of, a, of, of a, a lot of things that are going on. Um, you know, I think that there are some legislators who think that dense urbanization is the answer to everything. I'll say that that's not the, you know, I don't think everybody thinks that, but there are some legislators who kind of have this one size fits all mentality because they're just trying to get more houses built. Um, but overall, I, I think that we as a city are on a really good path with respect to the, the, the endorsed land use map that you guys adopted in May or that you endorsed in May in our general plan process um, that, again, truly reflects the community input and the community engagement that we went through, the two years almost of that, and then also our housing element as well. Well, it seems crazy to me what they're doing. The first way they take away the money from the redevelopment agencies, the only way we can have affordable housing because of the how price of real estate has gotten so high here is to subsidize it and so now they've taken away our ability a lot of our ability to do that and at the same time they're pushing uh further density on us at the time when we have lost like a million people in the state and we were losing one of our members of the house of representatives because of losing population <laughs> and so they're jamming more population as i say it looks like they want to have a statewide planning department and just dictate <laughs> what we're supposed to do. I, I, you know, that really goes against the grain because all of us here have been working hard for a lovely community. And, and just willy-nilly to, number one, I don't see the need because we're losing population statewide. Secondly, they are trying to put it into areas that we have created for low-density residential, semi-urban, type of environment that, that our people came here for and and then they're as i say they're taking away the funding but through ending the redevelopment agencies so 
I don't get it. I, I, I wish some of these people in the state had ever been councilmen or planning, <laughs> uh, you know, members of the planning departments or on the planning commissions to see exactly what they're doing. Because I, I think that they, uh, you know, from afar in Sacramento, uh, some of them really maybe not have a background in city planning. So anything we can do, Mina, to fight some of these bills, I would really appreciate it. Maybe we need a entourage to go to Sacramento and kind of explain things to some of those members of the assembly and state senate that may uh, not understand city planning. I, I think there is a lack of that knowledge. Mr. We, Jones, we have, oh, go ahead, Tracy. I was just say, um, you know, with, you know, uh, having uh, Mina with us and our partnership with Cal Cities, we are very, vo very vocal on um, bills, particularly housing bills that have, or uh, land use planning bills that have negative impacts on the city. We're very vocal in opposing those bills. So, you know, and Mina keeps on top of it. And again, she talked about how many thousands of bills that you had to evaluate this last year. I mean, thousands of them. And so it keeps her extremely busy. Yes. Well, if she thinks I or the mayor or any other council member would be of help going there, I'd be on the next plane because I, I think that this is a dire situation and I think we've got to stop it right in its tracks. We've thank done, you. thank you, Mr. Jones. We've done everything possible these last uh, year and a half, perhaps two years, uh, and Mina can attest to that, um, in trying to stop these bills working with Cal Cities. But unfortunately, I'm told that Sacramento does not listen to the opinion of cities through Cal Cities, which is the, org which is the State Association of Cities. And um, I think what is important to mention as we heard from Ms. Leba, that none of these housing bills actually provides affordable housing, not one. So, no. uh, and, and that is really the sad part. If they think in Sacramento that ultra density leads to lower priced housing, one only has to look at a more crowded Orange County, more expensive Orange County, or even New York City. So uh, ultra density, will not work, it will not lower the price, and as long as there's no provision for affordable housing or any funding mechanism for cities, it's not going to happen. It, this is very disappointing. Uh, Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Ms. Leva, I appreciate your efforts in Sacramento and the craziness that Mr. Jones uh, illustrates so eloquently. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, to the question I have is for uh, our city manager, Mr. Powers. Uh, to combat the craziness that Mr. Jones illustrates so eloquently, uh, coming from Sacramento, one size fits all that is being imposed upon our wonderful community here in Thousand Oaks that has been groomed over the last 60 years to be the great jewel in California. Would, as I proposed before, a parking study be beneficial to combat, uh, was that AB 1401, and the future development, because as Mr. Parker illustrates, we're relying on Sacramento guidelines as well as their input. And then we're relying on developer input as they go through and develop a project and hopefully they get the number right. And we're basing this all on tradition with no actual study of parking demands. Would that go uh, to benefit the city in combating some of the uh, impositions uh, uh, Sacramento is imposing on our city of Thousand Oaks. Um, so I'll take an initial uh, swing at it, and uh, I'll let uh, any others give um, give uh, follow up. So I, I think, as I understand uh, what you're saying, is taking a look at what we exist, what we have in current developments, and in those current developments, um, is are we having parking problems and doing doing some sort of analysis around that um there's a couple of you know, points and and i may get some of this wrong so tracy or kelvin will have to to speak up to it or cliff for that matter um to the extent we have concerns about parking in specific areas and, and there's only been a handful of those for me over the course of my tenure here 
they're generally uh, unique to the site. Um, for instance, we had uh, some some issues over by the Thousand Surgical Hospital some uh, some years ago, where a lot of people were utilizing street parking uh, out there in the in the front. And it turns out that the orientation of the development is for doors to open out onto the street that are like the townhome style. And so they have plenty of parking. They actually have access parking on the interior. But due to convenience, folks are, are parking in street parking, which they're eligible to do, and, and using that to walk straight in their front door. We've got other little situations like that here and there. Uh, we have had some situations where we have code issues or code cases where we have overcrowding and how you know, we have situations at 850 work where we had uh, you know, folks doubling up sometimes tripling up in, in homes, doing a you know, day shift and night shift. Those types of situations are obviously difficult to solve for because they, they're more of a product of a, a broader housing crisis than anything. I think the biggest challenge for us as we're going through our housing element right now is that uh, the state uh, HCD, as they've taken us through the housing element that went to the planning commission at the last meeting, uh, has been very clear that any modification to current design standards is considered a development disincentive. And they, they see that as, uh, as, a, uh, as an onerous requirement, much like any other local requirement that would, would disincentivize um, maximizing housing production. And so from that standpoint, and Tracy, you can probably put a finer point on it, um, you know, even if we had a survey and had results of a survey, Based on that you know, recent information that we're receiving from state uh, HCD, I, I'm not sure that they would allow us to make modifications in our process. Tracy, am I right with that? Yeah, can let I, me, can I, let, can me. I make, uh, let me clarify something. I'm not referring to current development. I'm talking about future development that comes before the city. Yes. So that way we have an idea as to how much parking demand is needed in certain areas. So this is for future development. I want to be clear on that. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm what I'm speaking to is anything that's in our housing element, anything that would be developed in the future, they they are contemplating that through this process and, and view future changes that would impact those developments as that that development disincentive, as I understand it at least, Tracy. Yeah, so let, let me let me um, provide a little bit more context. Um, because Joe, you're right on you're right on the mark. So you have various um, um, pieces of legislation that impact our ability to make modifications to parking standards. Um, first is our objective standards requirement. So all cities are required to basically convert all of their development standards that could be deemed subject subjective to uh, make them objective. And parking standards could be deemed objective. Um, it would be, um, I would just say from a practical standpoint, I would rely on our public works director um, but, you know, parking for a florist versus a Starbucks versus a shoe store versus a dry cleaner versus a grocery store. There's so many different uses because parking needs are unique to the specific use because there are, you know, times that they're busy, times that they're not, and how many customers they usually get in. So any type of parking study would um, have to take into account specific uses and there's just thousands of uses so i'm not sure from a practical standpoint how we do that i'm not the expert in that but i'm not sure from a practical standpoint but more importantly the housing crisis act actually prohibits the city from adopting any development standard that results in um, an impediment to the production of housing and the state has already determined that parking um, mandates are an impediment to housing so we are actually prohibited from adopting any standards that would increase parking requirements because that would be deemed an impediment to housing. And the connection to that is that um, we would have to identify that in our housing element, which would be deemed a constraint on housing, which would impact our ability to get a certified housing element. So we have the housing element restrictions and we have the Housing Crisis Act restrictions on us making any type of changes to our parking standards where we would mandate more parking that is re than what is required right now. I follow what you're saying. And again, this is all the things I'm suggesting here is not commercial. I'm dealing with the residential portion, the apartments, condos, townhomes, yeah. Yeah. those kind of parking. And yeah. again, I'm not looking for it to be an impediment. I'm looking for it to be accurate. I don't care about whether it's more or less. Mm -hmm. We got to be a little more uh, reasoned and accurate on what we're doing. So it actually may be a benefit for more housing, depending on which way the study goes, is my point. Mm -hmm. Because we actually don't have a study here in Thousand Oaks. We don't know what uh, those numbers should be. And myself and my fellow council members are just going on tradition and what we think 
in a certain area for an apartment, condo, townhome should be. So I, I, I understand your concern and, and what you're telling me, but I'm not seeing this as an impediment. It could actually be a benefit to housing here in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Council Member Adam. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I just, in regards to some of the legislation that's coming out of Sacramento, it's, uh, you know, I agree with Ed and, and probably all of our council members, pretty heavy handed. Uh, SB 9, the duplex bill effectively does away with single family housing zoning in the state of California. And um, I just think that locally, any city and its council members know when it's best to build something, where to build it, what to build, far better than Sacramento does. But that being said, I understand where this is coming from. Uh, you know, if you look over the past couple of decades in a lot of cities, and uh, including Thousand Oaks, there's 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 always been a very strong anti-growth uh, segment that I think has pushed council members into some decisions that were basically not pro-housing. Uh, and, you know, if you look at our record on housing over the last five or six years, we haven't built that many units. But like Tracy said, the city of Thousand Oaks is turning the corner. We've got a general plan update that uh, allows for more housing in the city. We've got some great projects online, 299, the 1710 project, the Kmart project. So I think we've seen the light as far as the fact that we need more housing in the city of Thousand Oaks, and we're showing Sacramento that. Uh, you know, the, the rub is going to be how much Sacramento pushes back. It's just still not enough Thousand Oaks, but I, I think we're on the right path there. And as and I want to thank Kelvin and his department for uh, this report this evening. Uh, appreciate the self-assessment. You know, we're really in, in unprecedented times right now uh, as far as development. You know, we've uh, we put a lot on your plate, Kelvin, whether it's our 10 priorities or the, the housing element, the, the general plan update, objective standards, you name it. And we're, let's face it, we're in a tight job market right now, and we've got a COVID backlog, and this is affecting not just us, but the entire economy. And uh, I'm, But I'm quite confident that uh, our department is going to be able to deal with it. I like the, the plans that you have. I like the fact that, you know, we'll on a revenue ne neutral basis, bring in some outside help uh, for a little bit here till we get some people hired. I think that's gonna work well for us. I, I know as a planning commissioner, I was always impressed with our, our community development department because by the time a project would get to us, it had been refined to the point where it made sense. That takes time. Uh, a good example would be uh, the Nazarbekian project. Uh, that's the biggest uh, lot on Teal Boulevard, biggest vacant lot. Over, over the last couple of years, I've seen six different iterations of that project before it finally got to us on a pre-screen. And it, it's, still, it's still up in the air, but regardless, the first iteration was nowhere near as good as what we finally saw on the sixth iteration. And that's because of our planning department. These things take time, but we don't want to cut corners. Uh, we want to continue with quality projects here in the city of Thousand Oaks. And I know that's what our our planning department's going to continue to do for us. And uh, I, I see uh, Ed's got his hand up, but I thought maybe at this point, um, I would go ahead and uh, make a motion to uh, accept the uh, 10A report and the, I think there, Mayor, weren't there five provisions Five recommendations, there? one through five. Five yes. recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to put that motion on the floor. And then of course, I'm sure Ed has something to say as well. So I'll put that out there. Thank you. We also have Mr. Finley who wanted to say something. Oh, yes, I saw Mr. that. Mr. Finley, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I just wanted to follow up with uh, Councilmember McNamee's uh, question about our standards. And for parking standards, uh, we typically refer to the ITE manual uh, for both commercial and residential. And the reason we do that is because we want to be, we want to have a standard we can point to um, that's based on a lot bigger than just Thousand Oaks and it's defendable and it's adopted. And that, those are the standards that we, we use uh, when evaluating parking or anything else. Now, council can set different standards, of course, 
but staff always always refers back to the ITE manual for trip generation, parking requirements, et cetera. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Cliff. Mayor, if I could just add on real quickly on this SB9 business, you know, the duplex bill where as many as four units could be built in a single family lot. Uh, so as not to overreact to that from what I'm reading about less than 5% of the parcels zone for single family housing in the state of California would economically work for that kind of a project. Less than 5%. I don't think there's a whole lot in the city of Thousand Oaks. Thanks. Except for Conejo Oaks, maybe. Those are very large lots. Um, there's some maybes out yeah, there. I yeah. agree with you, Claudia. Yeah. There's some maybes. But the, um, I don't think we're gonna see any wholesale change in our single family neighborhoods. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with a lot of what Al just said. And I think the general plan update that we made would show Sacramento that we're acting in good faith here, you know, because a lot of us have compromised <laughs> in doing that to try to show that we are uh, trying to abide by at least I think perhaps what some of their goals are that we're not just, you know, being stubborn and resisting everything. But I would think that, uh, Madam Mayor, we ought to consider sending a delegation to Sacramento, and I'd like to participate in that. If I don't know how long this legislative session is going to last, you know, we're coming to the end of the year, but. Uh, I, I would love to go and talk to some of those committees to try to explain local government <laughs> and local planning to them and see if we could get some compromise, especially on that AB9 bill or SB9, whichever it is. Thank you. Well, both have already been passed. The governor signed both of them. Well, so maybe any, any future intentions they have then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and again, um, the Thousand Oaks had produced more than 1,100 affordable or low-income units with the assistance of funding from the Redevelopment Agency. Uh, once, and we've heard this numerous times, once that funding went away, we really didn't have um, a funding source to continue more with uh, building more units. However, what was available to the city of Thousand Oaks is an inclusionary zoning ordinance and linkage fees. And I had been um, advocating for that for several years, but to, to no avail. I am glad now that we are looking at putting some teeth into our inclusionary zoning ordinance because that is what we as a city will have to insist upon, whether it's 20%, 25% of units uh, to be affordable or else uh, really everything will be for naught. So we do have a motion on the floor to approve one through five. And if there are no further comments, then I will call for a vote. Madam Mayor, I just wanna make sure that there's no public comments on this matter. That's correct. I was just gonna confirm yes. with the mayor that there are no public comments Thank on you. this matter. Yes. We just checked. Thank you very much. And that is a new bill that we have that we need to comply with. Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And Madam Mayor, that motion carries 5 0. Excellent. Also glad to hear that solar installation is up. I think that is absolutely wonderful. People are becoming more self-reliant and not have to depend on SCE or these um, other companies. All right. So now our next up, we have 10B. Kelvin Parker is staying with us a little bit longer to discuss the initiation of a municipal code amendment regarding religious facilities in residential zones. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, before we move on to the presentation for this item, it's going to be presented by Tabitha McAtee from the Planning Division. This is of note, particularly because this is Tabitha's first presentation to City Council since she's been with the city. We've been fortunate enough to work with Tabitha for the past four and a half years. Previously, she worked as an intern in the city of Burbank. We were able to lure her here to the city of Thousand Oaks, and she's a local resident. She's 
started as our community development technician. She has since promoted to assistant planner. Tabitha has a bachelor's degree in architecture from Woodbury University. And she's currently finishing up her master's in public policy from our very own CLU here at Thousand Oaks. So with that, I will turn this over to Tabitha McAfee and she will take us home on this particular item. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Broker. Oh, Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Excuse me while I share my screen. The case before you tonight is a request to adopt the resolution initiating Municipal Code Amendment 2021-70229 and allowing concurrent processing of a special use permit to allow places of worship in the single family estate zones, also known as the RO zone. The Municipal Code allows a proposed amendment to the provisions of Chapter four zoning, if it is initiated by the adoption of a resolution by the city council, requesting the commission to set the matter for hearing report and recommendation. In September, 1964, the community voted to incorporate the city of Thousand Oaks from an unincorporated county of Ventura area. In October, 1964, City Council adopted the Ventura County Ordinance Code as a temporary interim zoning ordinance in accordance with the section 65806 of the Government Code of the State of California. On April, in April 2011, City Council adopted an ordinance MCA 2010-70418, amending sections of the Municipal Code, including Title IX, Planning and Zoning, regarding the findings for approval for special use permits. Religious facilities were added as a permitted residential use with approval of a SUP by the Planning Commission. The RO zone was not included in the residential zones allowed to operate places of worship or religious facilities in the original zoning ordinance adopted from the County of Ventura, nor through the MCA 2010-2010. 70418 amendments. The RO zone is the only residential zone that does not allow places of worship. It appears to have migrated from the original county code. In researching the issue, there is no evidence that it was neither excluded on purpose nor requested to be included. This is the first time that allowing places of worship in the RO zone has been formally requested. In April of this year, the Chabad Jewish Center of Thousand Oaks applied for an MCA to allow places of worship or religious facilities in the RO zone with an SUP, similar to the allowance of other residential zones on the permitted use matrix of the municipal code. If this MCA is initiated by city council tonight, the applicant will also file an SUP for a religious facility within the RO zone. The project site is located on 1515 El Monte Drive. The project site is located east of the 23 freeway and north of Jans Road, shown here on the vicinity map. And this aerial map shows the subject property, which is 0 0.82 acres or 35,719 square feet. The site is located within 350 feet of another religious facility and is a compatible use within the immediate area. Currently, there are 44 places of worship located within the city limits. 32 of them are approved in residential zones. The city's current regulations regarding religious facilities and residential zones are contained in the residential zones permitted use matrix 
of the Municipal Code under institutional and civic uses. This slide shows an excerpt of the currently allowed uses in the permitted, permitted use matrix, specifically in the institutional and civic category of the residential zones. These residential uses are either allowed by right, allowed with a planning application like an SUP, or not permitted in that zone. You can see the red boxed area under the RO zone showing the proposed SUP allowance for places of worship. Currently, this field in the code's residential use matrix is blank or not permitted. This vicinity map shows all of the RO zone properties that will be affected by the change of use to allow places of worship. The project site is also included on this map. There are a total of 669 properties in the RO zone within the city limits ranging from 0.11 acres to 1.32 acres. Residential properties encompass approximately 49% of the total amount of land within the city limits. RO zoned properties represent approximately 1% of the total residential properties. Given that places of worship are allowed in all other residential zones and that and the relatively small portion of RO zoned properties within the city Allowing the proposed use in RO zones is not anticipated to have a significant impact citywide. And this request meets city council goal number A, to create a more equitable, accessible, safe, welcoming, and inclusive government and community, regardless of race, color, ethnicity, religion, sex, physical or mental ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, age, language, education, and or socioeconomic status. It is staff's recommendation to adopt resolution initiating Municipal Code Amendment 2021-70229 and allowing concurrent processing for a special use permit to allow places of worship in a single family estate zone or RO zones. Upon initiation by the City Council tonight, the Community Development Department staff will process the MCA to allow places of worship in the RO zone. If City Council allows concurrent processing, the applicant will submit an application to the Community Development Department requesting the approval of an SUP. The SUP application will be evaluated for compliance with all City standards, including operations and any proposed site improvements and a draft MCA and SUP will be reviewed by the Planning Commission for a recommendation and then returned to the City Council for final action. And this concludes my presentation. Staff, as well as the applicant, Rabbi Brisky, and his representative, Mr. Thomas Cohen, are available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, uh, your presentation, Ms. McAtee. Uh, very well done. Congratulations on your first presentation to council. I do have a um, question, but I see that Mayor Pro Tem Engler had his hand up. Uh, I will go to him then before I ask my questions. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I want to echo a very nice job on your first uh, foray to the council. Nicely done. Um, the, the question I have really, we have, um, this seems to be an oversight from years ago here, from 10 years ago or so, not to have included this in the first place. Um, just in terms of uh, in terms of uh, history, though, we have what you said, 44 uh, houses of worship in, in town, and 32 of which are in currently in residential areas. Are, do they all have SUPs uh, attached to them? Yes, in the existing use matrix, all um our zoned properties have to do the special use permit application in order to have a place of worship. And, and as far as uh, compliance with SUPs, has there been any issues with the, the current uh, um, holders of those S SUPs? Um, in the other churches you're asking? Yes, in the other areas, the, the 33 or whatever the number was of current uh, SUP holders. That information, I don't know, but um, 
I'm not sure if any of the other staff members know that information. If I may, Councilman. Thank you. Typically, we don't have a history of historic issues with these uses and with their SUP. Typically, the SUP is to mitigate any potential factors or impacts that the use would have on a particular area or location. And if there were impacts, there's processes in place whereby that could be addressed in an effort to mitigate that and to bring the use in compliance into compliance if that were to occur. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, I have a couple of questions. This particular property uh, actually has been at that location or the use of um, the, um, the, um, the religious facility that, at that location has been there for, I believe, uh, at least more than four years, more or less. Is that correct, Mr. Parker or Ms. McAtee? Um, the applicant, Mr. Uh, Rabbi Brisky, is holding up two fingers, so I'm assuming it's. Oh, I two don't years. see him on here. Okay. Uh, yes, I think it's been a number of years that it has been operating at that at that facility, and um, um, okay, then maybe I'll just ask him about why it is coming before the city now. Is he in the room? Yes. Um, it is available. Oh, I was there. over Mr. Cohen would be here too, but. Uh, Good uh, evening, I Rabbi. Rabbi Brisky, how are you? Nice to meet you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for having me. And I'm very, very uh, touched at the first of uh, Tabitha's uh, presentations for such a beautiful uh, project there. Um, Mr. Jones, when he was campaigning, I think two years ago, or when was it? I don't remember. Um, I, I actually met me at my home at the time. And. Um, we were in process of talking to the city. I remember Andy, Mr. Powers, and uh, there was a fellow, Steve Marks. I'm not sure. I remember the, the city manager at the time. Um, and that's where RO came up with uh, this, this interesting rule. Just these three houses, um, for some reason, everything across the street is R1, but these three houses were this RO um, uh, you know, loophole here. Um, then, it just cost a lot of money and between construction and all that um we didn't have the money to go ahead with the i think it's about a nine ninety five hundred dollar uh, fee just to um, apply and lawyers cost money and um so we stopped we stopped but that, that, was, that was the main reason and uh, now we do have the backing the funding and we're ready to go forward and do it uh, right Excellent. And so obviously because it is a, a corner there, there's a stop sign, a four-way stop sign, and uh, my church, St. Patrick's Episcopal Church, is right up the street there. So I have watched the, the process and progress with your home there in the corner for the last, oh, I don't know how many oh. years. Um, and I'm intimately familiar. So uh, my question is the parking is can be an issue at times, as you probably know. Uh, it has a blind curve, it seems, and there is not all um, uh, that much street parking available on that slope. Is that something that you're going to address after, should the council initiate this, or how would that be handled? Rabbi Grisby, yeah. I'll, I'll, oh, be I'll help are. you answer that. Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the city council and city staff. and. Tabitha, you've been a joy to work with up to this point, and uh, thank you for all you've done. Uh, yes, we're going to be addressing parking. Um, the interesting thing um, about Rabbi Brisky's Chabad uh, is that it's uh, it's it's a, it's a neighborhood uh, place of worship where uh, membership. Uh, I think Rabbi Brisky, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it's roughly about seventy percent of the of his congregants uh, walk to the facility. That is uh, a, a uh, just a part of the uh, uh, experience of being in the Chabad. Uh, secondly, uh, there will be uh, an effort to, the property is large enough to uh, take parking uh, into, uh, into the property so that we can uh, make sure that we're satisfying the city's standards. And uh, so that'll be uh, worked through very carefully with city staff. 
uh, if you initiate tonight uh, as we move this through uh, a special use uh, permitting process. Thank you. We have a question by Council Member Jones. Well, I just, rather than a question, I'd like to welcome Rabbi Brisky and uh, I appreciate his uh, attendance tonight. He said I met him at his front door. Well, I've met most of the people I know in Thousand Oaks at their front doors. Uh, so that's not unusual. He actually let me attend one of his services. I'm glad that the mayor pointed out that he has been in operation for a short time. In fact, he let me as a uh, little Protestant uh, person recite the 91st Psalm for his congregation. <laughs> I told him that we learned that during World War II. That was called the Soldier's Psalm. That was the one that they recited when they were in a foxhole with the bombs flying overhead and to give them courage. So. Uh, I've spoken too much here, but uh, I just love to see you, Rabbi Brisky, and uh, thanks for coming, and good luck with the uh, temple. Did you want to make the motion, Mr. Ed Jones? Yes, I'd yeah. love to make the motion. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Oh, wait a Thank minute. We much. have a hand up, but okay, Mr. Adam? No, uh, that's good. Ed made the motion. I was completely concur, and I just wanted to say shalom to Rabbi Brisky. You and the Chabad bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. It's great to see you this evening. And Tabitha, it's great to see you as well. And congratulations on pursuing your, it's MPP, right? MPPA. Uh, MP, oh, MP, oh, that's a combined degree, right? It's public M policy and administration. Yeah, great. That's a way to go. You are the future of our city, Tabitha. It's great to see you this evening. Thank and, you. And uh, I'll support the motion. Excellent. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? Madam Mayor, we do not have any public speakers. Excellent. Then we have a motion. Uh, please vote. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Excellent. And uh, congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. You much have a success. nice. You thanks have... for dancing with me all those years for Hanukkah. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, I've got a picture of him at my booth when I was running, giving me a big kiss, holding a baby. Oh, uh, stop it! <laughs> Not everything you have to say. Everything you don't have to say. <laughs> All right, uh, we, go, we now go to item 10C, which is about water and wastewater financial plans and proposed rate adjustments. And this will be presented by our revenue operations manager, Sherry Johnson. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you, Madam Mayor, city council members. So this discussion is for our biennial water and wastewater rate study. Joining me tonight is Cliff Finley, Public Works Director, and from Raptelis Financial Consultants is Sanjay Gar. Raptelis Financial Consultants assisted city staff by preparing tonight's financial plans and cost of service study, and has done so for many years. So tonight, for your consideration and approval, our water and wastewater financial plans a water cost of service study, a request to set a public hearing in December, and two years of proposed rate adjustments, which would go into effect for water, March of 2022 and January of 2023, and for wastewater, July of 2022 and July of 2023. Financial plans are updated every two years and a cost of service study every six years, alternating between water and wastewater. The purpose of these studies is to perform a comprehensive review of the city's utility funds and to provide transparency into what the city's water and wastewater utility funding can expect in the years ahead. 
Also, these studies help to ensure that the city has the financial resources necessary to meet ongoing operating and capital budgets. It serves to analyze the cost of importing water and determines appropriate revenue and rate adjustments amongst various customer types. They serve as the foundation for the proposed utility rates you will hear about tonight for the calendar years 2022 and 2023. Let's take a look at the water fund. In addition to this year's financial plan update, which helps determine our overall water utility revenue needs, a water cost of service study was performed. This additional study identifies the actual cost of service utilized by each particular customer class to determine an equitable allocation of rates amongst various customer types. Due in large part to sound financial decision-making, measured rate adjustments, and appropriate maintenance of infrastructure, overall, the city's water fund is in a strong financial position. Key recommendations of the water financial plan update are to adjust the overall water rate revenue by 1% per year, this will ensure cost recovery and sufficient funding is available for unforeseen events and emergencies. Another key recommendation is to pass through the cost increase of our imported water by approximately 2.5% for 2022 and 3% for 2023. The third recommendation for the water study is to reallocate rates amongst the various customer types and services to ensure an equitable distribu distribution of costs that more closely represents the actual cost of providing each service. The water rate study considered a variety of factors which affects utility rates. One of those factors is the city's water reserve policy, which consists of target levels for the water enterprise. This policy ensures that adequate operating capital emergency use and working capital for future capital improvement projects is available if needed. The total reserve is approximately 31 million. Another factor considered in the utility rate setting process was the water capital improvement plan, which was approved by council this past June. The water CIP has an average expenditure of 9.4 million per year for the next five years. A rate adjustment would enable the city to more effectively build reserves and incur no debt as a result of our CIP expenditures. You may notice that there's substantial amount of projects derived from our water master plan planned for fiscal year 2022. Some of those projects include the rehabilitation of several pump stations and reservoirs and upgrades to an, our entire water infrastructure management system. The chart you see here shows how our current and recommended rates for fixed meter based rates would be affected. These fees overall would be minimally impacted. Most residential customers have a 5 8 inch by 3 quarter inch or a 3 quarter inch meter. And these customers would experience a 41 cent per month increase in their flat rate meter charge for 2022 and a 27 cent per month increase for 2023. The percentage variations associated with various meter sizes derived from the cost of service study, which reallocated the overall revenue adjustment needs amongst various customers to ensure that our customers pay appropriate rates that are proportional to the demand they actually place on our water system. Basically different meter sizes place a different demand on the water system. So let's take a look at pass-through costs. The city's wholesale water supply cost is nearly $18 million per year and is the most significant cost driver to the city's water rates. City water is delivered by Cayugas Municipal Water District and historically, they've raised their rates by approximately 3% or higher each year. The overall proposed city pass-through rate would be applied to all commodity rates and allocated equitably amongst various customer types. As you see here, the city's actual pass-through rate is less than the Cayugas increase. And this is because our cost of imported water only accounts for a portion of our water budget expenses. Therefore, it doesn't impact our rate payers to the full extent. In addition to the meter base rate, 
the residential water usage is billed on a three-tier system. This shows how the city's overall revenue adjustment plus the recommended pass-through adjustment allocated amongst various users would affect a single family residential's commodity or tiered water rates. The average city customer uses 16 units each month, which means they stay typically within tier one, which has a one cent per unit increase in 2022, and a little into tier two, which has a 24 cent per unit increase in 2023. In addition to tiered commodity rates, the city's water service area is divided into five zones. Depending on whether water needs to be lifted to higher elevations, a pumping lift charge is assessed. Currently, our pumping lift charge is 22 cents per 100 cubic feet or one unit of water. Due to increases in energy costs and pumping infrastructure maintenance, mixed with the reallocation of rates to apportion charges based on the actual demand to the system, the proposed rate adjustment for pumping lift charges is an increase of 18 cents per unit per lift in 2022 and one cent per unit per lift in 2023. The proposed overall adjustment to water service rates will ensure that the water fund ending balances will remain in good standing. Lastly, it's important to note how low, moderate, and high usage bills would be impacted. An average residential customer using 16 units per month with a 5.8 by 3 quarter inch or 3 quarter inch meter and no pumping lift would be minimally impacted at an increased cost of approximately $1.50 per month. Looking back, when we evaluate the water rate adjustment history, we see variations in adjustment percentages each year. This is primarily due to the ever increasing cost of our imported water which continues to represent a significant pressure on the water funding's net revenues. The water financial plan recommends an overall 1% rate adjustment to our fixed and commodity rates, plus the pass-through adjustment, resulting in the overall proposed 3.5% and 4% adjustments that you see here. To put this in perspective, the city's average residential water customer compares favorably amongst other water providers that are in close proximity to our area. Looking at the left-hand side of the slide, we see current rates compared to other local agencies. On the right, we see how the proposed city rate adjustment compares to other local agencies planned 2022 adjustments. The proposed rate adjustment would place the city in the same ranking order as our current rate structure. But it's important to note that other water purveyors in Ventura County with lower rates have lower costs. And that's due to local less expensive water sources such as groundwater or reclaimed water. Additionally, the city performs ongoing and timely maintenance on its infrastructure. Other purveyors may not keep their infrastructure maintained to the same standards or on the same maintenance schedule as the city. Moving on to the wastewater fund, here you see the wastewater reserve fund. The total of the recommended wastewater reserve fund is approximately 27.6 million. You may recall that the wastewater revenue bonds were paid off early in 2018. And in fiscal year 23, the debt with the state water resources control board will also be paid off. So due to strategic financial management, our wastewater fund will soon be debt free. The wastewater CIP, also approved in June, has an average expenditure of $10.1 million per year for the next five years. The wastewater financial plan recommends an overall 3% revenue adjustment. And this adjustment would enable the city to more effectively build reserves and to occur, incur no debt as a result of these improvement expenditures. Our busiest year, 2022, includes numerous upgrades to our essential wastewater infrastructure that are currently underway, such as the final rehabilitation work on the digester and secondary clarifiers, overhaul of the fats oil and grease station, and upgrades to our wastewater interceptors. 
Under the proposed financial plan, ending balances are projected to decrease from fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 2025 before recovering in fiscal year 2026. An increase of 3% for the next two fiscal years would have a minimal impact on our residential customers. This increase translates to a 90 cent increase for our residential customers per month in 2022 and 93 cents in 2023. Overall, the city's wastewater fund is also in excellent financial condition and the city has an extremely efficient and high performing wastewater operation. A brief snapshot of our wastewater rate adjustment history shows only marginal increases to the fund in recent years. To fund necessary capital improvement projects, maintain sufficient reserve levels, and prepare for inflationary adjustments, the rate study recommends a 3% rate adjustment beginning July 1st of 2022 and July 1st of 2023. Historically, rate increases would occur at the beginning of the calendar year, but due to the change in the method of collections for residential wastewater service charges via the county property tax bill, Combined with the cost savings experienced by this change, we were able to defer any adjustments until July. The chart you see here shows how the city's current and 2022 proposed monthly wastewater service rates for a single family residential customer compares to other agencies in our area. Overall, despite our expansive and highly modern and efficient infrastructure, the overall monthly rate for our single family residential customers is the second lowest wastewater rate in the county. The proposed wastewater rate adjustment as compared to other agencies proposed or pre-planned increases has no change on the ranking order as our current rate. So here's a summary of the next two years. The good news is that no major nor unexpected revenue adjustments are needed. For water, we're proposing a 1% revenue adjustment increase for the next two years, plus a 2.5% and 3% pass-through rate for imported water costs. And for wastewater, we're proposing a 3% revenue adjustment for the next two fiscal years. Should Council accept these financial plans, cost of service study, and the proposed rate adjustments, then a public hearing shall be scheduled for December 14th. Staff recommends to approve the water and wastewater utility financial plans, approve the water cost of service study, and to set December 14th as the public hearing date for rate adoption. Staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the presentation because it shows how thorough and fiscally conservative the city of Thousand Oaks is. We have excellent staff that keeps a close eye on on taxpayer rates and dollars. Do we have any questions from council? I don't see any hands. Then um, do we ask, first I need to ask, are there any comments from the public? None? Madam Mayor, we just checked and we do not have any public comments. Okay, so let's see. Uh, council member Kevin McNamee put up his hand first, followed by just, Al Adam. I just, uh, Madam Mayor, would like to uh, make the motion and uh, as recommended by staff. Excellent, thank you. We have a motion, Mr. Adam. Were you gonna do the same? Uh, yeah, oh. I was. I uh -huh. just wanna, I, I just ran some numbers real quick on the, uh, on our water bill. If you calculate the, uh, the list of water bills with our neighboring cities and agencies, they average about 107 a month. We're at about 112, so we're about 4% higher. But on wastewater, they average about $64 a month and we're at like 31. So we're like 50% mm -hmm. less yeah. than all our sister cities and agencies. So we're really uh, right in the ballpark with what we're charging. And yeah, I, I concur with the motion, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I think this was the one I was gonna compliment Sherry on. So I'll, I'll compliment her on both reports. <laughs> thank you. All right, we have a motion and uh, no further public comments. Please vote. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember Jones? Aye. 
Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena? Yes. That motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. And with that, we go to item 13A, follow-up reports on meetings, conferences attended by council members. And Mr. Engler went to San Fran no, not San Francisco, but Sacramento with the, our legislative affairs manager, Mina Leba, I believe. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, earlier, uh, middle of last month, we had our California League of Cities uh, meeting in Sacramento this time. It was our first meeting in a year and a half that was live. And I was happy to be able to attend on behalf of the city and uh, shared the uh, spot with our, our uh, legislative analyst, Mina Leba. Um, I just want to point out that uh, part of what we were able to accomplish at the uh, within the city, and um, we typically um, do great work in our city, but at this particular um, event, we were awarded four awards. I just want to, uh, it's a what's called a Beacon Spotlight Award for community greenhouse gas reductions. And throughout uh, the city of Thousand Oaks, We've achieved, I think I'll hold this up, I think, for people to see, a 28% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, primarily due to our selection of a um, our electrical uh, provider that uh, produces our electricity for us. It's a major way that we've uh, gone after greenhouse gas emissions, and I think all of us in the city should be proud of our, of our public works department and the... Uh, uh, people in charge of our climate action plan. Uh, it is uh, credit to them, and I was happy to be able to uh, uh, receive those awards from from the uh, California League of Cities. Along the way, we we there's the California League of Cities uh, conferences have a lot of uh, informational uh, seminars that uh, are uh, brought out for people, and I was able to participate in several of those. The one that I wanted to mention to everyone. Uh, was a, I, I took a fire safety and uh, wildland uh, mitigation, wildland fire mitigation track and attended several of the group's uh, conference, uh, conference lectures. And um, I just want to pass along to everybody that um, we, the, the recommendation now from the, from the fire service given that we have a uh, very dry drought uh, going on right now, is to be prepared for uh, wildfire. And by being prepared to be um, to harden your home against wildfire, there are several uh, local agencies that you should contact, not, not the least of which is our local fire department, the Ventura County Fire Department. They would be happy to give you some ideas on how to harden your, your home against fire. So that was the uh, major takeaway from those um, seminars that I attended. Um, and I would like to turn it over to Ms. Leba if she would like to add anything else. I actually think, Mayor Pro Tem, you did a great job in presenting on the conference as well as the award that was bestowed to our well-deserving Public Works Department. Um, again, it was a well-done conference. I hope Next year, we have more council members attending. And uh, thanks again for all you do, council member, Mayor Pro Tem Engler, for representing the city. And um, kind of hearkening back to our, our former discussions on, on the state and, and um, the direction that the state is, is attempting to move the uh, cities and uh, usurping some of our authorities, in my opinion. But um, we, uh, we have st stood pretty firm in the past and, and represented the city. I know that our mayor sent numerous letters protesting some of the bills that were uh, being proposed. Some of those we won on, some of them we did not. And uh, the bills that uh, we see before us tonight are the ones that uh, managed to pass despite our firm protests. So we have been working in Sacramento and, and trying to uh, mitigate some of these issues but uh, it is a hard row for us to hoe sometimes, and uh, we're swimming upstream uh, against some of the 
larger cities that uh, perhaps uh, benefit from some of these things. So with that said, uh, we are we are doing our best with the state and uh, we uh, would love any assistance that my colleagues would love to give. Absolutely. And yes, the city of Thousand Oaks is immensely proud of the Beacon Award for the reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions by joining the Clean Power Alliance in 2019. We were the first city in East County to do that, and it is paying off. So mighty proud of that award. And Mr. Engler, are you keeping that in your living room or are you bringing that back to the city? <laughs> I, was, I was savoring it for just a little while. <laughs> But yes, I, I will. I will bring it back to the city. Yes. Um, I have. We actually were awarded four awards four. Uh, along mm -hmm. that same uh, lines of being uh, 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 working on our resiliency for uh, greenhouse gases, and um, I will uh, make sure we get those uh, back to the people at the city who truly deserve. That. Very proud of our staff in making this happen. Thank you so much. And uh, the only update that I have is that I had the. Uh, immense honor and pleasure of welcoming the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Mr. David Cameron, to the city of Thousand Oaks last Tuesday. It was quite an experience, uh, very, uh, very impressive, and it's, um, it was wonderful to have him visit Thousand Oaks. So with that, I will now toss to uh, our city manager, Drew Powers. Thank you so much, Mayor Bill de la Pena. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for the, um, uh, the great reports and uh, good dialogue this evening. Our next meeting will schedule for two weeks from tonight on the 26th of uh, October. As the council adopted on their uh, consent calendar earlier this evening, we do have a new state, uh, state law in effect. That state law requires us to take monthly action on where they're uh, continuing in a, in a virtual state. And that requires that that be the same state for all meetings. And so therefore we will, uh, uh, for the remainder of the month, all of our uh, committees and commissions will continue in a, in a virtual state. That said, um, we are, uh, currently anticipating a return to chambers on Tuesday, the 9th of November. So I just want to put that out for uh, for everyone out there. So we're, we're currently targeting Tuesday, the 9th of November as return to chambers. On the meeting for the 26th, currently uh, have several items. Uh, we will be um, acknowledging um, the tragic anniversary of the borderline uh, mass shooting uh, with uh, a citywide day of remembrance. Um, we'll also provide a community commitment award from the mayor. And we have a public hearing currently slated, a solid waste ordinance uh, revision, and two department reports. Uh, a report on standards of operation for council to really modify those operations that uh, to incorporate the virtual participation that we see uh, continuing forward even when we're back in chambers. Uh, and also an update from um, uh, Dr. Helen Cox and the public works team uh, on our climate and environmental action plan um, and uh, the draft strategies that uh, uh, the working group there has been, uh, been uh, working on as a part of our general plan update. Also, uh, finally, we'll have a Council on Aging annual report and that will be um, under committee commission and board reports. Uh, that will be on the 26th of October. And that concludes my update. Thank you, Mr. Powers. And uh, I'm very saddened to report tonight and also to adjourn in memory of a distinguished community member, Steve Bertram. He passed away October 7th from brain cancer. Steve was a seasoned executive in the biotech industry and a leader for the world's most successful biotechnology companies, including Amgen and Atara. After obtaining his MBA from Michigan State University, Steve started working at Upjohn, where he contributed to their work fighting the disease lateral sclerosis. In 1997, he began work at Amgen as a senior HR manager and was promoted during his tenure to a member of the executive leadership team in various capacities, including executive director of human resources. 
After many successful years at Amgen, Steve began a new role at Atara Biotherapeutics as Senior Vice President of Global Human Resources. He was present at the early stages of Atara's growth and played a key leadership role in the oper operationalization of the Thousand Oaks T-cell manufacturing facility. Between his time at Amgen and Atara, he took six months to train for a Mount Everest base camp trek. Steve was actually training for a trek in Iceland when he was diagnosed with cancer. Steve's wife, now widow Rebecca, said, Steve climbed the highest mountain and now is amongst the clouds as an angel looking over all of us. He always loved the movie The Lion King. I told him that he is our Mufasa. He will live on in all of us. Two months and two days from diagnosis. Life can change in an instant. Don't take anything for granted. Time is precious. People are precious. To honor him, as he said to us, do something that fuels your soul. We mourn Steve's passing and extend our sincere condolences to his family and his many worldwide friends. Steve will undoubtedly be greatly missed. And this meeting is now adjourned in his memory until October 26th. Good night.